I'd like to set things up this morning by sharing with you a brief story. One day, a 12-year-old uh, boy becomes a Christian at a special church meeting. The next week at school, his friends are, are questioning him about his experience. One of his friends says to him, uh, tell me, uh, did you hear the voice of God? The new Christian boy says, nope, it didn't happen that way. Another one of his uh, friends says, well, did you, did you see a vision? Did God speak to you in that way, through, through a vision? Once again, the Christian boy says, no, I don't think it happened quite like that. The friends were a little confused, and they said, so, so tell us, how did you know that you got saved? How did that happen for you? Well, this new Christian boy thinks about the question for several moments, and he finally answers by saying, well, it, it, it's kind of like when you catch a fish. You, you can't, can't see the fish. You can't hear the fish. You just uh, feel the fish tugging on your line. And I just felt God tugging on my heart. I like that. Let me turn a corner and bring that over to our message for today because that's a, a helpful image of what it's like to experience an assurance of salvation. It helps us to know what it is like to be sure that we are children of God. By that I mean just like that boy who felt the tug of God on his heart. Just like that. And here's my main point. There is a, a solid sense, there is a solid support that we can have that we are are in God's family. We can have that, that sense. We can be sure that we have genuine faith in Jesus for good, valid reasons. You see, God wants all of his children to be assured of their salvation through faith in Jesus. Every one of his kids, he wants that for them. He doesn't want his people to be wallowing in the mire of doubt and uncertainty. He doesn't want his kids to be worried that they have eternal life. Not at all. God wants true believers to rest in the fact that they are saved through faith in Jesus. One of the verses that we are going to be looking at this morning brings out that very point when it says that these things have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, well, what do you mean there is a solid support for knowing that I'm in God's family? What do you mean by that? What reasons does God give to me to assure me that my faith in, in Jesus has good, sufficient support for it. Uh, you say, Jeff, I, I, you don't understand something. You have no idea how much I question my faith. I, I feel oftentimes like my faith is on shaky ground. So how does God point to Jesus as the basis for my salvation? What evidence does God give me to assure me that I have eternal life through faith in Christ? Well, for our time together this morning, what I'd like us uh, to do is, is zero in on answering those questions as we unpack uh, the text for today. So go ahead and open your Bible at this time, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John chapter 5, we find that God gives us not one or two or three, not even just four, but, but five ways that God testifies to his Son as the basis for eternal life. 
Five ways. So let's go ahead and take a look at that first way together in 1 John chapter 5. And it is spelled out for us in verse 6. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, words it like this. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. Let's stop right there. You might recall the time after Jesus died on the cross that the Roman soldiers who were there, they took note of the fact that Jesus died. And yet there was one particular soldier who perhaps wanted to make doubly sure that Jesus, in fact, was dead. And so this uh, soldier, he takes out his spear and, and he pierces Jesus' side. And do you remember what took place? Immediately flowed out of Jesus water and blood. Now, the water that's referred to in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, is not referring to that scene when Jesus died. Nor does the water in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, have uh, reference to the time when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. It's not talking about that. The water in 1 John 5 or 6 is not even identifying the time when Jesus uh, was encased in water or amniotic fluid in Mary's womb. It's not even referring to that. What we discover in 1 John chapter 5 verse 6 is a historical event by which Jesus came. Now, how did Jesus come by water? And when did Jesus come on the scene with H2O? How did that take place? Well, it makes most sense that 1 John 5 or 6, where it's talking about water, is referring to Jesus' water baptism. When Jesus went through the waters of baptism, he initiated his public ministry. Um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And so I submit to you that the water that's referred to in 1 John 5, verse 6 has reference to Jesus' baptism when he went through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River. Of course, that was the time when uh, God the Father's voice could be heard from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he comes on the scene at his water baptism. That was the time when God the Father testified to Jesus as his Son. That's just one way that God testifies to Jesus as the basis for our eternal life through the water connected to Jesus' water baptism. Let's look at a second way that God testifies to Jesus. It's also found over here in chapter 5 and verse 6, where it says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. This also refers to a historical event by which Jesus came. What does the blood refer to? It refers to the death of Jesus. Jesus' ministry started with water, and his physical, earthly ministry concludes with blood. So John's insistence that Jesus came not only with water, but also with the blood suggests that he was refuting a certain false teaching that was taking place at that time. Uh, there was a false teacher by the name of Serenthus, and Serenthus was spewing folly. He was speaking air about Jesus. He and others insisted that Jesus was born just as a man. And that he died just as a man. We hear that argument all the time, don't we? 
where people think that we're making a god out of Jesus, that we're worshiping this Jewish guy who was a carpenter in Israel many, many years ago. And so that's how Serenthus thought of Jesus. And they claimed that for only a brief period of, of time in the ministry of Jesus, that this divine spirit, the divine Christ, the Logos came down from heaven and it descended on Jesus at his baptism. And then they would say that that spirit, that Logos, the divine spirit of Jesus vanished. It, it left at the time that Jesus was crucified. Well, is that true? Was Jesus simply just a mere ordinary man, just a regular guy who people made a big deal, a big fuss over him? Did the heavenly Christ abandon Jesus at the point or just before his death and come on to Jesus at the time of his baptism? Is that really the case? No. That is heresy. That is false teaching. John is teaching that Jesus is God in the flesh. God, very God. Man, very man. Not only at his baptism and at his crucifixion, but throughout the duration of his life. And if you were to do a study of the Gospel of John, you discover that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is Jesus. So if even in eternity past, Jesus, as God in the flesh, pre-existed before his time in Bethlehem, coming to the planet at his birth. Jesus always was, he is, and he always will be God. And as God in the flesh, Jesus' public ministry started with the water baptism at the Jordan River, and his public ministry ended uh, when he had died on the cross at Calvary. Uh, in the teacher's Bible commentary, Curtis Vaughn makes this a good observation. John taught that Jesus Christ, note the joining of the human nature and the divine title, came not simply with the water of baptism, as the Gnostics teach, but also with the blood of the cross, which they denied. The eternal God was incarnate Jesus, not simply through a short period of his life, but throughout the entire course of his human existence. So what are we saying here? Let me recap for just a few moments. We're saying that God testifies to Jesus as the basis for eternal life based on water, connected to Jesus' water baptism, and connected to Jesus' blood, John says, which deals with Jesus' death. Let's quickly look at a third way that God testifies to his son as the basis for eternal life. It's also found uh, in verse 6. It says, it is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. Uh, the word spirit that we find in verses 6 and 8 is not referring to the human spirit. It's not talking about your spirit or my spirit or someone else's spirit. Uh, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Oftentimes when we pose questions uh, to God in his word, we get answers if we simply would read in the context. And so God tells us what spirit this is referring to. It definitely is the Holy Spirit. That cannot be said about the human spirit because it says the spirit is the truth. So this is not talking about your spirit, my spirit, other human's spirit. It's talking about the spirit of truth. We know this is not referring to a human spirit because people lie all the time. We are skeptical as a people because deception, scams, people who are ripping people off and intentionally deceiving people with misinformation, false news, are rampant in this day and age. 
In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus uh, says, let no one deceive you, as he's talking about the end times. And deception uh, is one thing that, that marks our day and age in which we live. But this is talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, according to chapter 4, verse 6, John 14, 17, John 15, 26, John 16, verse 13. So what does the Spirit of truth do with this truth that he possesses? Well, what the Spirit of truth does is he testifies. He points to something or to someone. Specifically, the Spirit of truth testifies to Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 26. The Spirit's witness came through the prophets, the Spirit's witness comes through the Scriptures. And the next two verses share that the Holy Spirit completes a trilogy of testifiers. Notice in verses 7 and 8, it says, For there are three that testify. Here it is. The Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Well, what's the point of mentioning that there are three that testify? Why is that even expressed? Well, you might recall even from reading in the Hebrew Bible and the, the Old Testament that it's important to have um, a c collaboration of witnesses, that there need to be two or three witnesses to confirm every fact. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, facts are confirmed. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 16, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. How many of you are still with me this morning? Okay, a few of you. No, I, I, I know you're with me. Let's, let's look quickly at that. For, I'm trying not to belabor each of these ways that God testifies. So let's look at the fourth way. And we're doing great. We're already up to the fourth point here. And that is, God testifies that Jesus is the basis for our eternal life by way of God the Father. Notice verse 9. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper here as we look into the, the Greek grammar. It says, if we receive, and that's a first-class conditional clause in the Greek language which assumes something to be true. If I were to say, if my wife happens to be sitting there, then she probably will look at me right now and smile. And she did, just right on cue. We didn't rehearse that. But I was assuming something to be true, even though I used the word if. If, and it's true that something is a possibility, then X, Y, Z follows. If we receive, we assume this is true. So this could read, if we accept as true the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Uh, this is known as an argument known as a fortiori. What that has to do is it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If something on a smaller scale is true, we can certainly run to the bank that something of a greater nature is true. If we accept the witness of people, and of course, we don't think everyone's lying to us 24-7, we do happen to believe some people at times, if we believe the testimony of people on occasion, then why would we not trust God who's much more trustworthy than humans? That just makes perfect sense. And so the testimony of divinely appointed men of God is reliable, but the testimony of God himself is infinitely more reliable, more trustworthy than even anything that a human being can say. People are fallible. They make mistakes all the time. That's why they refer to practicing medicine. We're the guinea pigs or they are practicing law. But virtually in every area of life, people blow it. People make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. And many of you are happy to point that out to me. <laughs> and I appreciate that. We all make mistakes. 
But we need to, even though we blow it at times, we still accept the testimony of people, but to a much greater extent, we accept the testimony of God. Well, why is the testimony of God worthy of more acceptance? Why is divine testimony of great import to us more than other testimonies? It's because the testimony of God itself is truth. Of course, God is the highest authority. You can't get any higher than God. He's with his supreme court, if you will, of the universe. And he's always voracious. He's always truthful. He always speaks without error. He possesses unquestionable infallibility. We're told that God is true. John chapter 3, verse 33, it's impossible for God to lie. Numbers 23, verse 19, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, Hebrews 6, 18, 1 John 5, verse 20. But will you notice how verse 9 goes on to say, the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. What exactly is this testimony that that God is, is drawing to our attention here. What is this testimony that, that God has concerning his son? Well, most likely what this is doing is it's referring back to the threefold testimony in verse 8. God has testified concerning his son in the past uh, via the blood of Jesus, via the water baptism of Jesus, and this testimony is still valid today. You are doing so well this morning. You've gotten through the first four ways God testifies to his son as the basis for eternal life. Let's look now at the fifth. And this is an intriguing way that God testifies to Jesus. I think you will find this most interesting. And that is he testifies to his son as the basis for eternal life based upon a personal conviction. Unlike the other points which are external, they are outside of us, this point is internal. It is inside of us. The other four points are objective, distinct from you and me. This point is subjective. It is something that you know on the inside, whether or not people happen to sense what you're sensing. Once you accept the external testimony of Jesus, I mean really buy into what the Bible says about Jesus, then it becomes internalized for you. Until a person tastes and sees that the Lord is good, appropriates Jesus, not religion, but Jesus himself, not until that happens can that internal witness take place in that individual's heart. That's how it happens. You accept Jesus, and then the, the Lord does a wonderful work within our spirit. Where even though sometimes our, our conscience has condemned us in the past of things that we have done, we sense deep down inside that we really do know the Lord it's not predicated upon us, upon our good works, but the Spirit says, you're still mine. You belong to me. You're my child. You just need to believe it. You need to, to be convinced of it. Well, let's see the verse that draws us to our attention. Um, it's in verse 10, but before I even share that, I'd like you to listen to this uh, one scholar named Plummer. He says, the external witness faithfully accepted becomes internal certitude. I like that. That's why, notice with me verse 10, it says, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. This tells us that every believer has God's truth abiding within himself or herself in his or her heart. Now, there's a contrast that we need to understand. By contrast, anyone who disbelieves God has made God out to be a liar, a deceptive phony. You see, unbelievers make God out to be a scammer, a phony baloney, a person who is deceptive, who doesn't mean what he says, a con artist. 
I say that because of what it tells us in verse 10. It says, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. By the way, this is the fifth time in this letter that God gets up in the face of certain unbelievers and he calls them liars, opponents of God. These are either people who call God liars or they make God out to be a liar. We saw this in chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 22, chapter 4, verse 20, chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, there is no middle ground here. Either we believe what God says or we are impugning God's character. We are saying that God is like a rip-off artist. You cannot trust him. That's what some people would have to say. Uh, I know that this is a bifurcation. It's one or the other. Yeah, you're right. There's no middle ground. You're either on board with God or you reject him. You believe what he says or you don't. It's not that confusing. So what evidence, let's wrap this up. What evidence does God give us for the fact that Jesus is the basis for eternal life? Let's just recap. The waters of Jesus' baptism. That was one way that God testifies to his son. He also testifies to his son through the blood which was spilt at Calvary's cross. He testifies to his son through the Spirit, through God the Father, and your personal conviction. There's a multiplicity of ways that God points to Jesus as a sure anchor for your faith that you can be all in when it comes to Christ. Without holding back, without just putting your toe in the water, but being all in with Jesus. So what's your response? What's your response to all of this? How does this affect you personally? My prayer for you this morning and beyond today is that you will have a strong sense of assurance of your salvation. That you know that God will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. That there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, rather than feeling like your faith is on shaky ground, I want you to be assured of your faith in Jesus as the basis for eternal life. And there are several reasons that we saw this morning from his word. I want you to be confident, not cocky, but confident in the fact that you have now eternal life. You don't have to wait until you die and hope that maybe you'll get through the pearly white gates of heaven and be with God and his family. More importantly, if you're a true follower of Jesus more important than what I think, God wants you to be assured of your salvation. He wants this to be a settled fact in your mind and in your heart. I'd like you to listen to these life-altering words from 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may feel, so that you may hope, that you may desire, wish, no, so that you may know you have eternal life. God wants you to know it. He doesn't want you to hope you have eternal life or desire it. It's not some sin of presumption on your part if you really believe in your heart that you're a child of God. In fact, God tells you, I want you to know this. It's not about your feelings. It's not about um, your, your wishes. It's something you can know. People may accuse you of being arrogant. They may accuse you of being dogmatic or a Bible thumper. And that's okay. That's their issue. When it comes to you and me, we can have this issue put to rest once and for all. You can say within your heart, I know I'm saved 
based on the certainties of God's word. Whether I feel it or not does not matter. What matters is this resolved conviction that God has instilled within my heart. Also think about this. What you do with Jesus is a big deal. It determines your destiny. That's how big of a deal Jesus is. And that's where faith comes in. This passage, it, it stresses the great importance of believing in the Son of God. Now, follow me very closely here. Keep in mind there's a difference between believing someone and believing in someone. If I told you, you know, if, if, if you go in town, um, I, I, I want you to know that there's this, there's this place that has what are called easy blends. This delicious shake concoction, and you get to choose the toppings. It is fantastic. you got to try it. You could believe my statement. You're believing what I said. But there's a world of difference between believing someone and believing in someone. Again, believing someone is just taking what they said at their word as being accurate. But believing in someone is altogether different. Not only would you trust that person's spoken word, but you trust that person inherently. You trust in who that individual is, who they are. And so to believe in Jesus is not simply to say that you believe what Jesus says is true. It's to commit yourself in time and eternity into his hands. Really throwing the full weight of your trust in him. And once you exercise faith in Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit will testify to you. In his own way, uniquely, he will come alongside you and basically tell you, yeah, you're one of my kids. You belong to God's family. You see, I, I can't see that part of God's work in your heart. I mean, uh, there are some wonderful Christians we have, many within our church family, and you appear to me to be a Christian, and I see good works, and I see God flowing through your life, but I, I can't see what the Spirit of God is doing on the inside. That's a personal conviction which only true believers experience. So what's the alternative? What is the alternative uh, to accepting Jesus? What's the alternative to rejecting the evidence that points to Jesus? What's the alternative to refusing to believe in him as God in the flesh who died on the cross for your sins, to believe that he really did rise from the dead? What's the alternative to that? Well, our passage makes it clear. In essence, you're saying, I don't believe that. And God is saying to you, okay, you're calling God a liar. You're saying that God does not mean what he says. You're not to take God seriously. And that would be tantamount to blasphemy, to pointing a finger of accusation at God, to ascribing to God something that is erroneous, something that is false, that should not be tagged on to him. We don't want to go there. And so perhaps uh, you identify with that boy from the introduction. You have sensed this, this tug on your heart from God. God has spoken to you. He has confirmed to you. You feel that tug on the line. And if you have never come to Christ, but you still sense today, I, I think God is convincing me. Not Jeff, the guy with the wild tie. I, I, I think God is convincing me today. I think God has, has been working in my heart and my spirit, and, and I believe. I actually believe. Well, when you do cross that line and come to Christ, you exercise saving faith in him as your personal Savior and Lord, you will feel the tug on the line between God and your heart. He will make that real on the inside. 
The passage says, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Let me see by way of show of hands, how many of you believe with all your heart you have the Son? Praise the Lord. That's fantastic. And if you have never come to Jesus, you've seen all these hands that have gone up. These are people who don't believe in a dead historical guru who came and graced this planet for a time and then left as a martyr, but these are people whose hands were raised. Their lives have been changed. They've been transformed for time and eternity, and the invitation is open to you. If you've never come to Christ, we point you to him. We want you also to sense the tug on your line between God and yourself.